hear this story from God's Word this morning. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John just about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, He stood and began to walk and entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. The power of God upon Peter and John extended to this man. Amen. Amen. Uh, Today, uh, we begin this, this year. Uh, and as you can tell, this message was supposed to be on January 1st, but I'm going to just go with it, right? I'm going to go with it. It's, this, is, this is essentially the, the, uh, the, the first Sunday of the year. Some of, there were a few of us who were here last Sunday, but we've had a little problems getting people here at the church, right? Little, little, some trouble, a little bit of snow and ice, some people being sick, other things, you know? So I'm just going to go with it. as this, Just consider this to be the first Sunday of the year. How about that? All right. Uh, which is supposed to direct the theme for the year, so to speak, or at least it's that which I think is important for us as a congregation. Um, so, so today, uh, I want to begin not only by reading this story out of, uh, out of Acts chapter 3, but I want to begin with this other story, a very simple story, a very short story. Uh, hear, hear this story. Once there was a man who was afraid of his shadow, then he met it. Now he glows in the dark. Great little story, huh? Once there was a man who was afraid of his shadow, then he met it, now he glows in the dark. The point of the story, of course, is that there's a great fear upon people's lives. People have shadows. And shadows are representative of fears, at least in this story, right? Shadow is... uh, is about our fear. We have to face our fears. If we meet our fears and face them, things can change. Of course, the man now glows in the dark, right? Because when you don't have a shadow anymore, because you're not afraid of your shadow, if you don't have fear in your life, there's a, there, uh, you end up glowing. Uh, fear is a very powerful motivator, no doubt about that. Uh, it, it's one thing to watch a, you know, a, a scary movie or read some sort of uh, frightening book or something or read a story like that. Uh, it's one thing. But there are some things, some fears that we have that seem to go on and on and on. Uh, I don't know if you have any fears from your childhood. Lately, I've been having these crazy dreams. I mean, they come in different forms, but they have, I've had these crazy dreams. And it goes like this, you see. Um, it, it's basically, I have not practiced my French horn enough for the band. Okay, and that sounds so ridiculous, but I actually am afraid of this kind of thing. Like, I'm on the spot, and since there were only a couple of people who played French horn in the band, and I was, you know, supposed to know my part, it's pretty bad stuff, pretty bad stuff to, to, not, to not know it. And so it's like this constant dream I have over and over again. It just keeps going and going and going, you see. Um, it's one thing to, to have a fear that, hey, you know what, you just kind of can get past it quickly. I mean, some fears just don't seem to have an end. It's the point I'm making. Uh, and that's difficult for us. Uh, the dictionary says that fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. Uh, and that's not the first time I've shared that definition with, with this church. Uh, nevertheless, 
You know, I share that because fear is a powerful motivator, right? I mean, I'm going to go home today and practice the French horn, right? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Okay. But fear is a powerful motivator. Um, fear in the Christian life causes us to just freeze up. Sometimes fear in our own lives as, as Christians, you know, when we fear God, maybe God's too big and, and too scary for us, and so we freeze. We don't know what to do with God. Uh, that's the reason why I started the sermon or the service today with, you know, God being a God of great grace. God is a God of mercy, right? Uh, there's a healthy fear of God. Now, if we're going to overcome our fears, one of the things that really helps, of course, is that if we become brave. Bravery is important, right? You've got to be a certain element of bravery to go and meet Jesus Christ. Uh, quite a few years ago, there was a, um, a te- te- on television, it was a te- televised circus, and, and the, um, there was a trainer of Bengal tigers. And so here was this man who had like a chair and a whip inside of cage. Maybe you've heard this story. Uh, and he was, you know, using the whip and using the chair to, you know, to, to doing his act in the circus, right? Circus act uh, with his Bengal tigers. And suddenly the lights went out. I mean, it was dark. And the, the thing is that, of course, you know, the trainer could not see the tigers. The tigers could see him because they can see in the dark. And you know what he kept doing? Though the lights were out, he just kept cracking that whip and putting that chair out, and he pretended that he could see the tigers. Um, he was a brave man, right? He was a brave man. And, of course, you know, after 20 or 30 seconds, the lights came on and nothing ever, you know, it all, you know the tigers had left him alone. Uh, he was a brave person. We say that that person is brave, right? Um, what is bravery? Bravery, uh, d- bravery doesn't mean that fear is absent. Bravery means that we have... Um, that we're able to overcome by faith. That we have faith in overcoming that person or that thing, maybe those tigers, those things that, that are in front of us that, that uh, cause us to have fear. Uh, it's, it's, it's a belief in overcoming, you see, uh, rather than this, this belief that you're going to be overcome. That's what bravery is. It doesn't mean that the fear is absent. Uh, faith in overcoming. Bravery comes from a belief in winning. Uh, this sermon is about winning. It's about being a winner. It's about being a winner in God. And do you, the question is, do you want to be a winner in God? Do you want to be a winner in Jesus Christ? Uh, I think you do. I think that we talk a lot about being winners, being, having victory in Christ. I know I talk about that uh, often. Uh, and yet, so many of us don't have the victory that we seek. Uh, so many of us, let's be honest, so many of us are either just, we have too much fear of God, or we have an inappropriate fear of God, or maybe when it comes to, the, to our own way of living the Christian life, we have the wrong idea of what, what the, the Christian life is about. Um, if, you, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 7. Romans 7 is the kind of the classic passage in Scripture where we talk about being failures, right? And so many people live in Romans 7 thinking that, 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 this, is, uh, that this is descriptive of the Christian life. And it's obvious when you read this, why it seems to be a descriptive of the Christian life. Uh, Paul's trying to prove in the book of Romans that the law is something that is good, uh, and he has this to say beginning with verse 13. Uh, Did that which is good then bring death to me? Because what he's saying is that we fail under the law. We don't keep the law. Is that, did that which was good bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. He's saying that we get to really know what sin is by breaking the law. It's not a good thing, but he says that's the reality. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, uh, that the, agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. And he goes on. Point being that, that uh, many of us read Romans 7 and we think that that is a description of the Christian life. So what is this victory in Christ stuff? What does it mean to be a winner? 
before God. But I'm here to tell you, I hope we can all agree that whether or not that relates to your own life or not before God, you're not meant to live there. God's intention is for you not to fail when it comes to sin. God does not intend the Christian to live in that place of constantly being overcome by sin. We are called to being brave, to trusting that God can help us overcome our sin, you see. Not to live in Romans 7. Paul does not write Romans 7 in order for us to go, oh, oh, I identify with that. Oh, thank goodness. If Paul's always blowing it, then that means it's okay if I blow it and I can live there. That's not Paul's point. Paul's point is to show in that passage that the law is good and without the Spirit of God who dwells within the Christian, without the Spirit of God, then we are hopeless, you see. So, so, uh, so the Christian life is, is a, a couple of things I want to mention this morning about being winners, and it's important for our lives throughout this year. First of all, let's be honest. The Christian life is victory over sin. Sin does not control us. It does not take us over. We do not live under the power of addictions, you see. I know many of us have those problems, but that is not God's intention to leave you there. There's ways in which to address addictions. God does not have any desire for you to stay there and say, oh, well, I'm addicted, there's nothing I can do about it, and then at the end of my life, you know, God's just going to forgive me. No, God actually desires for you to have victory today in your life. Really does. He really, really does. And he gives you the, the means by which to get there. And here it is in Romans 8. This is why we are not Romans 7 people. Christians are Romans 8 people. Paul's trying so hard to make this point. Victory over sin. So I put on the board here, uh, Romans 8, all right? So Paul begins this way. I'm just going to spend a few minutes here, not, not too long. He says this. He says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, why does he say that? Does he say it because it's like, oh, okay, whew. Oh, you know, it's okay if I live in Romans 7, if I just live as a sinner all the time, and God's going to forgive me in the end. That's not why he says that. He says there's therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Why? Because he's going to talk about the power of God in our lives in Christ Jesus. The reason why there's no condemnation is really twofold. One is Christ has died for us. He's died on the cross, right? He's freed us from the guilt of sin. But you know what else he's going to free us from? You know what he does free us from? He frees us from the power of sin. Not just the guilt of sin, but also the power of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because we're free from the guilt and we're free from the power. Verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. What is a law? Now he's talking about the law of just, um, that that we're familiar with. If you're you're familiar with gravity, right, as a natural law, there's a law, right? If I go up up on this roof, right, and I throw myself off of it, the law of gravity comes into place, right? Guess what? But here's the, it's cause and effect. I will hurt myself, you know? I mean, I'm a pretty impressive individual. I could probably jump off the roof and, and you know, and be just fine, except for the fact that I broke my back, kind of like messed up my back years ago doing that when I fell off a roof. But the reality is, is that we know about gravity, right? It's a law. It's cause and effect. This is the kind of law we're talking about. So when he says that the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. He's talking about two laws. The first law is that of, I'll mention the first one here, go backwards, is the law of sin and death. If we sin, the result of it is death. That our relationship with God is broken. We don't have a, you know, when we're living in sin, you know, it's not like we're like buddy-buddy with God, right? We're doing the very thing that he doesn't want us to do, and he's not real, you know, real happy with our behavior. It's, this is called death, Right? Because our relationship with God is broken. It's a law of sin and death, cause and effect. Guess what? There's another law. It's the law of the spirit of life. Because Paul wants us to understand when the spirit comes to us, you see, the effect of that is life. It's a, there's a richness. There's a joy 
in our relationship with God. The law of the spirit of life, you see, cause and effect. Verse 3, for God has done with the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. What does it mean to be condemned in this context? It means that it is of no power. It has no power. Sin in the flesh is condemned. Sin does not have power over you anymore. You see, this is what the Spirit of God brings to us. Verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law, see, the law couldn't do it by itself, but in order for the, for the righteous requirement of the law so that God would actually be pleased with our behavior, the Spirit has come. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, this is the victory that we have as Christians, that we can live a life that is pleasing to God, right? I mean, there isn't, there, there's no such thing as just saying, hey, I'm a Christian, but then you don't live like it at all, right? You don't, you don't live like it. You know, that's, that's not what it means to be a Christian. If you have the Spirit of God, you are going to be characterized by faith, hope, and love. Those are going to be the marks of your life. You have faith, you have hope, and you have love. We should see a lot of love around here. And we do, because the, this place is filled with Christians. Okay, so that's just, that's just like a really foundational part of what it means to be a winner this year. Live in Romans 8. This is what I want you to do this year. Live in Romans 8. I'm not going to be preaching through Romans 8 this year, but live there. Live that life, okay? Don't live in Romans 7. It's not for you. Not that you shouldn't know it, but it's not about your life, you see. It's not what you're meant to live under. You meant to live in, under Romans 8. Okay, now, there's a second aspect to winning that I, I, I really hope that our church can get a hold of. All right? And this is related to the idea of what I call the spiritual bank. Right? We all have banks. Right? Most of us have bank accounts. Uh, you make deposits at your local bank. Maybe not all of us. I hope you do. I hope you have some resources there, and you have a checking account and this kind of thing. Savings account, perhaps. Um, some of us have a lot more than others. Uh, but, but, but you know what a bank is, right? It's some place that you make deposits, and occasionally you make a withdrawal. Um, in the same way that we make financial deposits in the bank, God has called us to make spiritual deposits. We are to be rich in Jesus Christ. You see, of course, that helps us live a, a, victory, a victorious life in terms of sin, Life over sin, free from the power and the guilt of sin. But, but, I, but I want us to, to go to another step. Now, when we talk about spiritual, a spiritual bank, um, we are called to continually recount, to remember the things of God, what God has done. Continually do that. Uh, this is why I began the service, and actually last week I talked about this, but I began the service uh, with Isaiah 63, 7. I will recount. See, I'm, I will make a deposit in my life, Isaiah says. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord. Now, how do we grow in our spiritual deposits to remember the goodness of God? If, if, you, if, all, if your understanding of God is that God is a mean father or a mean judge, you're going to have a really lousy account, spiritual bank, spiritual bank account. But if you know that God is good, that God's love for you will never end, then that deposit, that, that bank account, I should say, that bank account will just grow and grow and grow, and you will get return on your investment, if you will. So he says, look, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us. See, he's remembering all the good things in the past that God has done through Israel. And, that, and, and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Isaiah is saying, I'm going to invest in my spiritual bank account. I'm going to recount. I'm going to remember the good things of God. Okay? That's what this is about. Um, of course, why would we want to do this? Well, I've already said it. That we'd be stronger people. That we'd be people who are rich in Jesus Christ. Um, but there's another reason I want you to think about that this year. This year, I want you to think about this. We all want our church to grow. We want people to come into the church 
and to be loved, to know the goodness of God. We want to reach out to entire families. We want to reach out to individuals who are hurting. We want people to come into our church, and we wanted them to be a part of our family. That's a very important part of our life. But there's another thing that we want to do. We want to be kingdom thinkers. I'm talking about winning people to Jesus Christ. You know, it's great if our church is full and we end up having to go to two services and all these kinds of things. It's great. But let's be kingdom thinkers. Let's think about people who need to know the Lord. There's a sense in which it doesn't matter where they go to church. What really matters is that we are faithful witnesses to them and share Jesus Christ. The second aspect that I want us to think about this year is being evangelists. Now, as soon as I use the word evangelism or evangelist, it always frightens people. I don't know. I don't know how to be an evangelist. I don't know how to do this. You're scaring me, Pastor. But the reality is, is that the Bible makes it very clear that we're called to be evangelists. You know, Paul says to Timothy, he says, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And there's a very real sense that the only way that we're going to really fulfill our ministry is if we're capable. This has to do with the spiritual bank, right? That we're capable of sharing the love of God in Jesus Christ. And I think everyone here can share the love of God in Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus, I think you can share that. You can simply give people a, a hug. You can tell them God loves them and so forth. But there's a little bit more to this, right? Sometimes people say, well, how do I know? How do you, how do you know God loves me? Can you answer that question? If someone says, how do you know God loves me? Usually it means that you share your own story. I can tell you God loves you. Let me tell you how he's loved me, right? That's being an evangelist. There's many ways to be an evangelist, but that's one way of being an evangelist. And the question is, how much is in your bank account so that you can take out a withdrawal, if you will? Take that withdrawal and share that out of your own heart, you see, and out of your own mind. Are you an evangelist? Uh, You know, I'm scared about that. Once there was a man who was afraid of his shadow. Then he met it. Now he glows in the dark, right? Are you that person? Are you willing to face your fears, to be brave? This is where bravery comes into this, to be brave. See, I don't think you can be brave when it comes to evangelism, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. I don't think you really can until you are honest about your fears and you begin to invest in that spiritual bank account becoming rich in Jesus Christ. Now think about this for a moment. Remember, I started this message by reading from Acts chapter 3. Remember that story? Peter and John are going to the temple, and there's a man who is, what? He's lame. He's lame from birth. The story actually tells us that he's been lame for 40 years. He couldn't walk. 40 years is a long time. And remember what Peter says to him? Look at me. Look at us, he says. Look at us. He says, you know, I'm going to share with you what I have. And then he is able to look at that person and tell him to walk. He was able to share the power of God. Why? Well, we're going to find out. If you go to chapter 4, you'll discover, and I put it up here on the screen, you're going to discover why they had such power. Right? It's a really pretty simple idea. And it's this thing that God is calling us to do this year. Peter and John had been arrested. Uh, the authorities had taken them because they were afraid of all the people talking about, the, about, about you know, helping this person in the name of Jesus. And they were concerned about that because, you remember, Jesus said Jesus wasn't here anymore. He had died. Of course, Peter and John are going to tell us that he's risen from the dead. The story goes like this. Now, when they saw the boldness, these are the authorities, and they're really worried about them, And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, 
They were astonished. Check this out. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. <laughs> you want to be an evangelist? You want to share the power of God to save people from their sin, to help them live a full life in Jesus Christ? Get with Jesus. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. They weren't educated men. They were common men. Maybe you see yourself, well, I'm not educated. Oh, the pastor's so educated, so smart. Have you been with Jesus? If you've been with Jesus, you have a bank to draw upon. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? See, see people will do that with you, too. What are we going to do about, about Mary and, and Joe and George? And What are we going to do with them? They seem to have so much power in their lives. For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that way they may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Wow. Do you feel that way about your life? When you have make friendships, when you meet your neighbors, when you take chicken soup over to your neighbor who's been sick, or whatever it is, right? Do, 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 you, do you feel that way? Do you feel like this passion to be able to share the good news? Not to overcome people, not to, get, not to show them that you're better than them because you're not. None of us are better than anyone else. No, no way. But we have grace. And we can't but speak of what we've seen and heard. Is that the way you feel? Is that a picture of your life? Uh, you know, today we're going to have Holy Communion. And in communion, we simply share what we've seen and heard. Yeah, I, 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 I know that Jesus Christ gave us this this, this sacrament. He, he gave this to the church so that we could stand in testimony to the goodness of God. Uh, we can't help but share the death of Christ and the life of Christ because that's who we are. Uh, we are people who have victory over sin because we live in Romans 8 and we're people who are willing to be able to put investments, deposits, into that spiritual bank account again and again and again so that we can share again and again and again. And that's what we're doing right here. Would you pray with me as we come to communion? And by the way, you're all welcome to come to the table. We have an open table. You're welcome. You say, well, I mean, I don't even know if I know who Jesus is. It's like you'll, you can meet him here if you want today. He's here today for you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you have called us to be your hands and feet, and you've called us to live a life that's about winning, about overcoming our fears, about being brave, but brave because we know that you're with us. And so, Lord, I ask that you would come upon this bread and you come upon this cup, and that your very presence would be here, that this would not only be a symbol, but this would be a sign a sign, the presence of God in the bread and in the cup and in this built, very building that you would be here and give us strength and minister to each one of us. We pray this in your name. Amen. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you as often as you eat of it do this in remembrance of me and in the same manner after supper he took the cup and he said this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the remission of sins as often as you drink of it 
do this in remembrance of me.